Thanks, Julie, for using up so much of my time. <laughs> and speaking of my humility, I, I've written several books on how I achieved it, so those are available. <laughs> well, when I was invited to speak, it's always uh, a mixture of honor and fear. Uh, only because you guys, you men and women, you, you hear some of the best preachers that there are uh, in the West Coast, certainly in the country. And uh, I, I think that most guys who come to this opportunity to, to speak, whether we can beat it down or not, there's a, there's a half a cup full of hoping that when we get done, a bunch of you will say, oh man, that's the best speaker we've had all year. And so I've tried to beat that down because what I, what I really want you to go away with is something that will help your life to be more what you want it to be and more importantly, what Jesus wants it to be. And so I've been told that the theme this year is salt and light. And so I'm gonna entitle this sermon, Having a Godly Posture in a Hostile Culture. Having a, having a godly life in the midst of a culture that is actually hostile to our worldview. And I don't even have to explain that to you. You know that's true. You know that increasingly those who have a biblical worldview about sexuality, about marriage, uh, about truth, about home, about right and wrong, we're, we're actually seen as a threat to the modern worldview that there is no truth outside of us. We actually create our own truth. And uh, I get to create my truth, and not only don't, do you have to accept it, you have to applaud it. And so, as uh, Darwin came into our world and said, I can explain reality apart from God, and as soon as he did, it was realized that the, kind of the core of meaning in life evaporated. If all we are is a collection of randomly collected you know, uh, atomic bits that somehow got together to create the complexity that we see. If there's really no designer and no purpose, there's really no meaning. So you live and you die and that's it. Well, that vacuum of meaning then was, they f tried to fill it in all kinds of ways. Probably the guy who had the most influence on that was Sigmund Freud because he came in and said, I can tell you that uh, the meaning of life is happiness. The greatest happiness is sexual happiness. And we've seen where that has led, that now there is no restraint in our culture on sexuality. And guess what one worldview actually is a threat to that? The Christian worldview. So in some ways, we are like the folks of uh, Judah who when God got really upset with them that they had become as despicable as the original Canaanites, God brought the Babylonians in and three, three waves, right? And uh, they ruined the city, they decimated the temple and they took what was left of Judah into captivity. And in Psalm 137, those captives, they're, they're being mocked, they're being taunted by their captors. Probably the Babylonians are saying, where's your God now? You know, we destroyed your city. You think that temple was a, a symbolic demonstration of his dwelling amongst you? We, we raised it. It's gone. It's no stone is left on another stone. Where do you, do you guys think you are? Go ahead, sing your songs. Go ahead, worship. Ha! And so they say this. They say this line. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Well, I think we can play off of that today. How, how do we have a godly posture how do we relate to a hostile culture? Salt and light. Well, down through history, there have been three responses to that. One is that when the culture is at war with us, we go to war with it. We rant. We oppose it. We stand up and we adopt the same way that the culture is mad at us and mean-spirited and throwing you know, stones at us and hatchets and anything else and calling us haters. We're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna go to war with culture. Problem with that is what Paul wrote to Titus in chapter three of his letter. And remember, Titus was on the Isle of Crete and if there was a, a more debauched and uh, ruinous culture of the time, not only the Cretans were, as Paul says, lazy gluttons, liars, evil, but it was also a place 
that was at the forefront in that day of what was known as Jewish nationalism. As Jews had been dispersed everywhere, there was an increased understanding amongst them that, hey, we have to stand up for being culturally Jewish. And so on the Isle of Crete, these Christ followers had to battle both the, the pagan influences around them as well as this rise of, of Jewish nationalism. So what did Paul tell them to do? In Titus 3, verses 1 and 2, remind them, that is the Christ followers, to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient. Get this, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle. And this last one, we added just calligraphy on the inside of our eyelids, to show perfect courtesy toward all people. So the idea that if culture is mad at us, we're going to go to war with it and we're going to rant, quite frankly, is just not biblical. Well, on the far other end of the spectrum, there is the idea not to go to war, but to withdraw. And we see that around us. We see a, a lot of Christ followers who don't want to have anything to do with the culture. They, it, they may stay where they're living, but they don't interact with their neighbors, with people at work. They kind of just withdraw from it. But once again, the, the verse that probably underlines your theme of salt and light, Matthew 5, says you're the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God. So in other words, we can't withdraw from culture if in fact we're supposed to be the, the spice that seasons it. If we're supposed to be the light of Jesus Christ in this world. So if we can't go to war with culture and we can't withdraw from it, what do we do? And I know what you're thinking, we need another W, right? War and withdraw. Preaching class guys, do you get that? Okay. Well, here's what Jesus said in Acts 1.8. He said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses, right? We're supposed to witness to culture. That means we have to be amongst it. We have to be there, we have to shine the light, we have to be salt. But in order to be effective witnesses, in order to be effective, we have to be attractive. Now, fortunately, you guys are the best looking college in, in the nation, right? I'm not talking about that, although it's okay to take care of the temple, okay? <laughs> barn needs painting, the barn needs shaving, go ahead and paint and shave, whatever. But what I'm talking about is we have to have lives that adorn the gospel. We have to relate to culture in a way that is attractive. Here's why, because if your unbelieving friends, coworkers, relatives, neighbors, when you are amongst them and you're saying, look, I'm a, I'm a Christ follower and I'm gonna share my worldview with you, here's what they think. They think, okay, if I adopt your theology, if I adopt your perspective, I'm gonna get your life. And if we are just as cynical and mean-spirited and play fast and loose with truth as the culture does, they're gonna go, why would I want that? If you and I don't tell the truth, if we don't live the truth, if we're not consistent, if we're not gentle, if we're not smiling, if we don't have joy in times of adversity, why would anybody want our Jesus? That's why I'm saying in order to be effective, we have to be attractive. Now when it comes to salt and light, what that looks like is this, you know, salt, um, Monday night was Valentine's Day, some of you guys forgot that, shame on you. But uh, my wife and I, were, we, we just got home from 10 days in Maui, so we really didn't have any money left to go out. So, we bought some ribeyes and uh, I married a great woman. She likes beef, okay? So I'm, thank you, yes. So we get these great ribeyes. They're big and they're thick. And what did I do? The first thing I did was take some kosher salt and I put it all over and pressed it in. And I also did the pepper. That's all we use in the Hague household. It's one of our doctrines. Put them on the grill at just right. Took them off at 128, 
degrees, let them sit for a while. Juices were sucked, oh, it was amazing. But if all I did was take the salt canister and kind of hold it over, it wouldn't have done anything. Here's the thing, you listening? For salt to have effect, it has to have contact. But for salt to remain salty, it has to be contact without compromise. That's what Jesus said when he said, you're the salt of the earth, but don't let what you are salting influence the saltness out of you. So we are to be in the culture, we are to be relating to the culture, we're to have contact with those around us, but in such a way that we remain uncompromisingly Christian. The second thing is the light. The light has a, is to have a, a penetrating presence. Okay? We're supposed to show the way. Remember in Ephesians 2, Paul ends up in verse 10 after he says we were dead in trespasses and sins and God made us alive and he did it by grace through faith and he did it to show off his glory. Paul's burden there, his desire is to get all the way to verse 10 to say, and you are God's workmanship. You are his intentionally designed, crafted show off piece. You're his sample. It ought to be that when the people in Santa Clarita and they want to know what God thinks, how the gospel changes lives. It ought to be that he takes Grace Baptist Church and Crossroads, Placerita, I better be careful, Masters University, and throws them out and says, here, here's my samples. We need to be attractive in order to be effective. We can't be arrogant. I loved uh, the last song we sang where it says, you know, maybe you don't have a legacy. Maybe you die and nobody remembers you. Doesn't matter. What matters is what you do while you're alive. We can't be arrogant. We can't be those cynical know-it-all jerks that we all know. You know who you are. There are bombastic, mean-spirited, loud-mouthed Christians who are known only for what they're against. Rather, we have to be those whose godly character and humility and, and get this, reasonableness are clearly evident. We've got to be known for a careful use of truth. That's why you are here at the Master's University because we teach the Bible and we teach you how to teach and understand the Bible the way it was written. So you don't go in and pull something out of context, shake the dirt off the roots and then plant it in your argument. We've got to understand that the beginning place of meaning is what did the original author intend the original readers to understand from the words that he used. That's why we have to do our work. And we also have to have a gracious and winsome demeanor, right? We, gotta get, we, we have to be people that when we walk in the room, people go, oh good, she's here. Whether they're believers or not. To be effective witnesses in our culture, we must be attractive witnesses, not ranting at war with culture, not running, withdrawing from culture, but relating to culture as a witness that has no reason to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, and being characterized by the character of Jesus. Well, how do we do that? Well, fortunately, we have a good model in Jesus, right? You with me? I can't see you, so if you're smiling, thank you. If you're not, <laughs> please do. John 1, John 1, 14 through 17. This is John, the last surviving apostle. He is writing at a time when people uh, uh, who are second and third generation Jewish believers are being hounded to leave the church and go back to the synagogue. Gamaliel II, who was the high priest at that point, he added a curse to the synagogue liturgy, which is a curse against the Nazarene, those who followed the Nazarene. And Gamaliel said, you can't be both part of the church and part of the synagogue. And so there seems to have been a, a wholesale flood back to the synagogue by third generation uh, Jewish believers who never had seen Jesus. Their parents maybe did or their grandparents. But they were now kind of, I don't know, like a lot of people today. My parents raised me in the church and, I, you know, I think it's probably better than not being. And so John writes his whole book wrapped around seven miraculous acts. And at the end he says, a lot of other things Jesus did that, that I didn't write about, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that believing you have life in his name. It's, he's saying, look, come back. 
Don't give up Jesus. I love the first song, the goodness of Jesus. Yeah. So he said this in his uh, introduction in John 1, 14, he said, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace, right, and truth. Down in verse 16, from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus. So when we look at the New Testament, we imagine ourselves, we're in downtown Jerusalem, uh, maybe at the mall or something, and, and somebody says, hey, what does the body of Christ look like? We go, well, you're in luck. There he is. There's Jesus. He's walking around, and he's healing some people, and he's doing dialogue with the Pharisees. There's the body of Christ right there. And, and by the way, just so you know, he is, he is full of grace as well as truth. So truth and grace are not enemies. Truth and gentleness are not enemies. Well, who's the body of Christ now? No, this, this ear doesn't hurt, doesn't work. Who's the body of Christ now? We are. So you can't decide, oh, I'm a truth guy. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a truth woman. I'm, I'm a grace man. We got to be both. We have to be both. To be effective, we must be people of truth. To be attractive, we must be people of grace. Those have to go together. So how do we witness through the truth? Ask, uh, take your Bibles. I'm sure you have them in whatever form they are. Mine's on an iPad. 2 Corinthians 4. And I want to give you four ways that we must act and be in order to witness through the truth, in order to be men and women of truth. Very important, extremely important. I'm going to read through verse 7. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, light, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But... We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Very quickly, four things. To be a witness, to be a person of truth. Number one, you gotta be tough, okay? A, be tough. That means be courageous. Uh, verse one, therefore having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. Look at verse 16. So we do not lose heart. So that's known as an inclusio. That's Paul's way of saying uh, everything I've said between verse 1 and verse 16 all has this same idea of how we go about standing courageously in a hostile culture. We're going to be courageous, but you've got to be tough. You can't be easily offended by those that you're trying to help. You've got to be able to admit you're wrong. You've got to be tough enough to be humble. Here's the thing, we swim upstream against the culture, the current of culture, we just do. But you gotta swim upstream against the current of culture without allowing it to erode your edges. It's not easy. But we understand that the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to do the work of God in people's lives. So we have to be good with the truth. We have to witness to the truth. We have to know the truth. I will just tell you, dear ones, there's no substitute for knowing the Bible. There's no substitute for reading along the Bible, reading to understand the big story, knowing its theology, especially theology one, knowing how biblical truth and theological convictions relate to everyday life in our increasingly secular world. What we're doing here is giving you a biblical grid through which you can push everything else you encounter in the rest of life. Don't give in. Don't lose heart. 
Don't look at the news or listen to the news or all the social media and see all the things that are wrong and all the things that are broken. Don't lose heart. Remain joyful. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Why? Because of the goodness of Jesus and because in Christ alone, right, we've staked our claim. Secondly, be honest. Be very honest. He says in verse 2, we've renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of truth. That open means I'm going to be honest with the truth. I'm going to be honest with my life. I'm not going to become one who lies. I'm going to be able to commend myself to everyone's conscience. Be honest the way you use God's word. Not, you know, there's enough schlock going around the evangelical world. That's a word that I use to speak about, well, like Mark chapter 4, where Jesus is in the boat, right? And he's asleep, and they have to wake him up and say, you know, why are you, don't you care that we're perishing? And he stands up and he says, shh. And you won't believe how many preachers down through history have said that that's about if Jesus is in your boat, you can sail through the storms of life. And he's in your boat, dear one, get this, but you gotta wake him up because he's fallen asleep in your boat. And you, they take that text and they turn it to be about you. But the last verse in that text says, the disciples said amongst themselves, who is this guy that even the wind and the waves obey him? What Mark is saying is I'm trying to show you that this man is the one who one day will redeem the earth because he has power over the earth, even its brokenness. Don't be that way. Don't, don't go to a church that teaches the Bible that way. Don't go to a Bible study. Don't read books that are just going to try and teach you just enough to make you feel good about the author. Be honest about God's word. In our, in our little office, we took a mail room and turned it into a Spurgeon sitting room. Isn't that great? And on the wall, we have this big banner that says this. This is a Spurgeon quote. Scripture is like a lion. Whoever heard of defending a lion? Just turn it loose, it will defend itself. Be honest about how you use God's word. Secondly, be honest about being God's spokesman. He says we would commend ourselves. I'm just telling you, we need to be commendable in the the way we relate to people. We don't need any more smash mouth Christians, okay? We don't need anybody going on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or any of those places and just ranting. We don't need that. Paul said this to Timothy. Timothy was in Ephesus, a huge pagan culture. Uh, In 1 Timothy, he's right out of seminary. He's ready to go. He's going to appoint elders and deacons. He can hardly wait. By the time we get to 2 Timothy, it's five years later, and he's been kicked around. He's ashamed a little bit. He's afraid to suffer. He's timid. Uh, He's fearful. So Paul has to give him a short course in the gospel in chapter 1 of uh, 2 Timothy. But then he gets to chapter 2 and he says, And Timothy, here's how you should be. He said, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Paul was being superintended by the Holy Spirit so that what he wrote was a one for one with what God breathed out? I do. So do you. He's saying, Timothy, to be an effective witness, you not only have to be truthful, you have to be gracious. Why? Because he goes on to say, God may perhaps grant them repentance and lead to a knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been captured by him to do his will. Everybody you and I run across either has Jesus or needs Jesus. And those who need Jesus have been captured. We'll see a little bit more. Their eyes have been blinded. God's going to use us. Third, be mindful. I'll be mindful of the challenge. Look at verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 4. Paul's telling Timothy, or Paul is telling uh, the Corinthians... Look, 
the challenge we have is impossible. Understand that the challenge of gospel evangelism is like us trying to dig the Grand Canyon with a teaspoon. Can't be done. And you had better understand that. Paul says, even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. Get this. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. He says, Satan has so worked through sin that everyone who comes into this world is hard-hearted and blind. And you could shine as much light as you have in front of them, and it won't do any good. Be mindful of this impossible situation we have. That the nature and mind of every human being comes into this world, they, are, they come with inherited guilt, and they come with a sin nature, and they come with a pervasively depraved soul. And you don't, don't in any way try to limit that. Why? Because when you think that there's just a little bit of clear thinking, you're gonna try and shape the gospel to kind of nudge them along in that way. You're gonna try and make the gospel something that, that they'll choose. Remember a long time ago, they had these pins that said, try Jesus. Mm. That's, that's not part of the gospel. So you have to know that. Be mindful that God alone can bring about new life. Look what it says in verse five. For what we proclaim is not ourselves. See, this is very important in our day. I'm not here to tell you that David Haig has written this and written that, is doing this and doing that, and you know, I have a you know, paraphernalia with a name on it. I can't save one person. But God has given me the gospel and you. It's, it's a chisel that we put out, but God is the hammer who hits it to break hard hearts. It is a light that we put out, but God is the one who makes it effectual in opening blind eyes. That's what Paul says. He says, be mindful that God brings about save, salvation through the gospel. I'm not telling you anything you don't know. In verse five, for what we proclaim is not ourselves. We're not here with our own opinions, our own theology, our own everything, but Jesus Christ as Lord. We are proclaiming the beauty of Jesus. For God who said, light, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. All we're saying is that what we have experienced through the sovereign grace that God has brought to our lives through the gospel, what we've experienced, we are now putting out the gospel in hopes that God will do it to others. Now, Paul's autobiographical here, isn't he? He was walking the road to Damascus, right? Had letters in his pocket saying that he was an authority. He was out to put God's enemies in prison or worse. Because these enemies of God were trying to say that this man was God. He thought absolutely he was on God's side doing God's work. And then God broke into his life. And the reason I say this is autobiographical, Paul is saying, look, I thought I knew everything. I thought I had it all right. I thought I saw everything clearly, but in order to show me that I didn't see anything clearly with regard to God, he blinded me so that my physical blindness became a, a metaphor, a demonstration of my spiritual blindness, and it wasn't until Ananias came and laid his hands on me and I understood the gospel that the scales fell from my physical eyes, and now I recognize that that's what the gospel does spiritually to everyone who God saves. We're just holding out the light. That's our lives. So be tough, be honest, be mindful of the challenge, then verse seven, be humble. We must see that we are, he says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We ought to collude with that on the inside of our eyelids, folks. Paul's saying, you and I, we're just, a, we're just old clay pots. Do you know, you're not worth anything and neither am I. We're only valuable because of what we carry. 
right? The treasure is what makes us valuable, not us. I, I use this illustration too much, but maybe you haven't heard it. Uh, I think on my best sermon, my best counseling, my best writing, if there is such a thing, is nothing more than five loaves and two fish that I offer up to the Savior. On your best day, all you have, I, I probably don't even have five loaves. Okay, MacArthur has five loaves. <laughs> I have a Twinkie, okay? <laughs> so do you, <laughs> don't laugh. But it doesn't matter because unless God sovereignly multiplies the benefit of what we give, nothing good happens. You understand that? That's, that is one of the greatest ways not to be guilty, not to feel like, man, if only I had done this, if only I had said this phrase, if only I had remembered this illustration, if only I had said this to that person when they were down. No, do your best and leave the rest, right? He multiplies the molecules of the bread and fish. He multiplies the benefit of what we bring him because we're just containers. Jars of clay, if you've been to Israel, you walk around the archeological sites and you look down. I remember the first time I went back in 92, I looked down and there's all these pieces of pottery and I'm picking them up. And I'm, oh, these must, these probably go back to the time of Jesus, right? And I went to our guide and he, he was a Jewish atheist and he said, uh, that is nothing. It's, uh, it's probably only 1,200 years old. I said, my country's only 200 years old. He says, yes, yeah, it's nothing. <laughs> Your jars of clay, no one, jar, no one jar is more valuable. It's only what we hold that's valuable. We're easily broken. So why? Why does he say this? Well, he wants us to be reminded of who we are, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Well, we transition then to we're humble and our character leads to being gracious in our witness. Witness through truth. Again, back to Titus chapter two, verse nine and 10. And again, Paul is talking here to Titus and he's supposed to turn this over to the, the slaves that are in the church. And he says, bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that, okay, if you're studying the Bible and you see a so that, now we're getting into the purpose. Now we're getting into the, you know, the money line. So that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. So do you, do you understand the way we live, the way we smile, the way we hold our tongue, the way we love, the way we sacrifice, the way we teach, everything we do is meant to adorn the gospel, to make the gospel as beautiful as it is. We have to understand that we are not only people of grace or of truth, that we are people of grace. Now, I don't have a lot of time, but you gotta understand something about grace. Grace is not a commodity. You can't go to the Bible bookstore, if there, there aren't any more. You can't go on Amazon and buy more grace. We, we, we talk that way, I want more grace. Grace is God's benevolent attitude toward those who don't deserve it. It's a state of mind. Now, everything that God is flows out of his love. His love is his primary defining characteristic. That's why John says God is love. If you took theology, you know that the Trinity uh, interhabitates one another so that uh, the perichoresis, they are held together so closely that they are one and that which holds them together, the intra-trinitarian glue is love. And it is out of that love that all the other attributes emanate, including grace. So really when we are being people of truth and grace, it is based on our understanding of our joy to reflect the love of God for us. He has forgiven much, what? Loves much. We've been forgiven much, we love much. And one of the extensions of love is grace. Not treating people the way that they deserve. How do we do that? Well, very simply, three loves. Number one, love your enemy. Isn't that amazing? Jesus said, I say to you who hear, love your enemies. 
Do good to those who hate you. But love your enemies and do good and, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you'll be sons of the Most High. For he, the Most High, is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Now, I was having coffee with my friend Todd Smith, who is pastor at Crossroads. Uh, we don't compete, we collaborate. We're on the same team, doing the same thing. I'm committed to the feeding of the sheep, regardless of who does the, sh the feeding. In fact, I'm having lunch with him here today. Not here, but somewhere else. So I'm sitting with him, and we, he quotes one of his mentors, Daryl Delhousay, who is the president of Phoenix Seminary down in, guess where, Phoenix. And Delhousay said, you know what? It's not, it's not in us rejecting culture that progress will be made. It's in us being Christianly, and then he said, so that culture rejects us so that we can love them in return. One of the most powerful things that will happen is when you are rejected and you love those who are rejecting you. When you pray for those who don't like you, when you seek the best of those who are your enemies. It's a forgotten doctrine, largely, in our day. Secondly, love your neighbor. Jesus said this is one of the great commandments. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart, with your soul, with your mind. This is the great and first commandment. You shall love, the second is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So in the way that I look after my life and think that I'm valuable, I'm supposed to look at others. Now, by the way, if we all did that, the whole racism thing would be a moot point. But then he says, thirdly, love one another. And he says there's a different standing standard for loving one another. You ever think in John 13 and 15 when he says, a new commandment I give you? And you're thinking, wait a minute, Deuteronomy 6 says we're to love our, you know, our neighbors as our, ourselves. He says, no, I'm now telling you to love one another, not as you love yourself, but as I have loved you. Because now he has come and died on the cross for us. He has sacrificially given his life so that we might not only be in Christ and united by faith to Christ, but now we are united by faith to everyone else who's united by faith to Christ. We're talking about Christian unity here. So in conclusion then, I've tried to suggest to you a way to have a godly posture in a hostile culture. How can we sing the song of God in this culture? Easy. We've got to be effective. Not at war, not withdrawing, but witnessing to our culture in ways that adorn the gospel. Our strategy is truth and grace. We, to be effective witnesses, we must be people of truth. No substitute. But to be attractive witnesses, we must be people of grace who adorn the gospel with the way we live. Why? Well, this is, it's because God has designed the mission of the gospel to go through us. That's plan A, and there is no plan B. Father, thank you for this group of men and women who are dedicated to you and to taking you out into the marketplace as teachers, as lawyers, as doctors, as professionals, as moms, as dads, as neighbors, as friends, as church people, as pastors, elders, deacons, deaconesses. In every way, Lord, may we adorn the gospel with our lives that you might work through us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.